We have a reproducibility problem in research. What does that mean? That's the topic of this special episode of Healthcare Triage. Very, very rarely in science do we achieve a result that we are absolutely, positively sure is correct. We almost always use statistics to give us some estimate of how likely it is that our results are true, but that answer rarely equals 100%. We'd like to think that most of what we find, write up, and publish is correct, but a lot of that relies on how we understand the word correct. One way to define correct is a conclusion that someone else can reproduce. What do I mean by that? I mean that if someone else does the same experiment as me in another time, in another place, they get the same results. I mean that over time, people are able to get the same results I do when they perform similar experiments. By this metric, many areas of science are falling far short of what we'd like. This is a good time to pause and talk about replication and reanalysis in general. Replication is basically following the same exact steps the researcher took originally to see if the same answer can be achieved. Reanalysis is taking the original data and seeing if rethought and better statistical methods would achieve the same results. Replication is making more of a splash recently. For instance, just a few years ago, Amgen, a biotech firm in California, set out to confirm published research findings in cancer. They chose 53 landmark studies and tried to replicate the experiments as they were described in the papers. Now, it's not likely that 100% of these studies would achieve the exact same results. As I said before, no study is foolproof. Plus, some of those papers were cutting edge. It's possible that some aspect of them might be difficult to replicate. Nevertheless, we would hope that most of them would be reproducible. Half? Is that too much to ask? Evidently it was, because only six of them, or 11%, resulted in confirmation of the scientific findings of the original papers. The Amgen study involved peer-reviewed research, meaning that the studies had the stamp of support of the scientific community, yet it turned out that the research contained within them could not be replicated. Amgen isn't special. A year earlier, a team at Bayer Healthcare found that they could only validate 25% of preclinical studies to a level that would allow them to continue projects. And in 2015, the results from a similar effort in psychology were published. More than 250 scientists from all over the world attempted to replicate 100 articles published in 2008 in three of the top psychology journals. They set up very structured protocols on how these replications were to take place. In short, only 39 of the studies were fully replicated, meaning the results found were similar to those that were published. An additional 24 studies were close, they had moderately similar findings, but they still weren't considered replications. A full 37, though, were considered non-replications. The results were absolutely not the same. Why does this happen? Let's start with the simple truth that being published in a high-profile journal is something many scientists want badly and high-profile journals are more likely to publish new and exciting results. This leads to incentives, barely hidden, to achieve new and exciting results in experiments. This can lead some scientists to take overt action to make sure that they achieve new and exciting results. This is otherwise known as fraud. As much as we want to believe it never happens, it does. Clearly, fabricated results are not going to be replicable in follow-up experiments. But fraud is relatively rare. What happens far more often is that science is biased in some way. We might have a bias towards publishing positive results rather than negative ones. We might conduct experiments in such a way that it's more likely to achieve positive results, even if those choices are subconscious. We might measure many outcomes and report only on the ones that are significant. And sometimes we insert biases without even realizing them. We might be disorganized in our experiments. We might not adequately maintain our materials or data. We might be reluctant to share our data or methods for fear someone will take them and do something with them without us. Part of this is our research culture. For too long, we as scientists have professed a need for sharing and community while remaining closed and secretive. We've called for valuing methods and rigor while truly valuing reputation. We've argued for equipoise and disinterest while really treating science as a competition. We've argued for skepticism while acting like dogmatists. We've called for quality in others while privately, we go for quantity. And the scientific community has rewarded these attitudes. Productivity leads to notoriety, which leads to papers and grants. There's little accountability. Deviating from the system rarely leads to rewards. This has all led to the current crisis. People are losing faith in science. 
billions of dollars are being wasted in research that can't be fully trusted. But many are working on solutions to these issues. Journals are beginning to band together and discuss how to do better reviews. Many trials now need to be registered, so the decisions have to be made about how to design, conduct, analyze, and report findings before the research takes place, while researchers are still behind the veil of ignorance. Independent organizations like the Open Science Project are encouraging transparency and registration at every step along the way. The NIH has also gotten involved by calling for the creation of training modules to enhance data reproducibility. They are focusing their efforts on four domains, experimental design, laboratory practices, analysis and reporting, and the culture of science. We here at Healthcare Triage are going to tackle two of these domains, experimental design and analysis and reporting. We like to think that we've got something to say about what makes a good study, well, good. Therefore, we will explore all the key concepts you need to consider in order to ensure that your research is as bias-free as possible. And we think we're pretty good at analysis and reporting as well. Therefore, we'll talk about what makes a good paper, how to present and discuss your results, and how to avoid the mistakes many make in overselling their findings. Both of these modules will consist of many episodes or chapters. They're all short and sweet, they're all freely available, and they're open to anyone. If you're interested, you can get CME or Continuing Medical Education credit for watching them. Links and more information will be below. We also would appreciate feedback. There are short surveys you can fill out. Links again will be below. It's hoped that these modules will help scientists at all levels improve the quality of their experiments and how they report them, and that by doing so, we might improve the problems we're currently seeing in many areas of research in terms of reproducibility. This training module is part of a series funded by the National Institutes of Health.